Lucky Dolly, welcome to Australian Musician. Woo good to be here. Hey, was there a keyboard or some sort of piano in your home growing up? Yeah, there was, yeah. There was a um, just a little upright piano, nothing special. But um, yeah, I think, uh, I think mum saw the kind of interest in music that, that myself and my brother had and um, pretty early on she got a uh, piano in the house which proved to be a very good thing. <laughs> yeah. So your brother Clayton uh, yeah. is also a professional musician. That's right. What was your attraction to, uh, for both of you to the organ? Well, I think, I think it's the power of it. That certainly was for me, the organ over the piano. I remember um, uh, this musician Brian Morrison brought over a Hammond organ and a Leslie and we set it up in the garage. And I just remember like just the, this is on, yeah, just the, just the screaming power of it, just the, you know, and the fact that it just kept going, you know, you could get hold of there for as long as you want and it still keeps going. You know, as on a piano, it's just, you know, it eventually dies out. I think there was something that instantly attracted me um, with that kind of sustain and that kind of, you know, that vibe of it and the energy and the power and the fact that you could be so loud and then so quiet and you could change the draw bars and just just very dynamic. I think I, I really took to it quickly and, and just wanted to find out everything I could do on it. Yeah. So were you playing albums by artists that had Hammonds in them? Yeah, so um, I suppose the first organ influence was would have been Booker T, Booker T Jones from Booker T and the MGs. And prob that was probably the very, no, that it was either Green Onions or Back to the Chicken Shack. I'm not sure which order came first, but um, Jimmy Smith's Back to the Chicken Shack. But I definitely it took more to Booker T than I did with Jimmy Smith and just all those, just the soul and the feel that he had, all the long notes and the, and the way he could just fit in around the song. And, and he was kind of quirky too, which, which I really like as well. Yeah. So how did the clavinet come into the equation and in particular the whammy? Clavinet. Yeah, well the clavinet, it was always the sound that I heard because I was so into, you know, I went from blues to soul and then funk was the next thing and there was always this sound and, and, and I'd ask people what it was and they said it was a clav and, I, and that was, and there were, I remember there was a weird patch on my like Korg X5 that had clav written on it and I was like, oh that's kind of it, sort of, you know, but you know, it was okay and then my friend said, oh, there's a, um, I was just down at this second hand shop in North Adelaide and there was a clavinet there. And I'm like, what? I didn't even know what one looked like, you know, I, there was no internet back then. And um, so I just rushed down there and I was looking in the shop and I, was saying, I come across this thing that's like, doesn't really have much on it. There's no LED screen and, you know, and I try and play it and it doesn't work. And I'm like, but it's 125 bucks. And I thought, nah, stuff it, I'll get it. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of money to me back then. And um, yeah, so I bought the clav and my dad and helped me, you know, try and get it sort of half working. And then as soon as, as, soon as we did, it was like, oh, that's it, it's so funky. It's just like pure funk underneath my hands. So yeah, that was, it was another thing, you know, I just, it just felt natural for me to play that because I, I was always very percussive in the way I played anyway. So um, yeah, that, I really took to that. And eventually, uh, they started making new parts for clavs, so I could prop I could fix it up properly, which was good. Mm. And then, oh yeah, sorry, your question about the whammy, that was another thing. Like when I started playing the clav, I remember this guy, this random guy, came up to me and said, "Oh yeah, you know they they made a clav with a whammy bar on it." And I'm like, "What? What are you talking about? A, a whammy bar?" And I always thought, "Wow, that's amazing." So I think it was like. 2002 or something, I finally got a computer and I started looking on the internet and nothing, no no mention of a whammy clav. Um, you know, 2003, oh, i just have another look for that thing, still nothing. It wasn't until like 2007 or 2008 when someone posted a picture of George Duke back in the 80s playing one of these uh, at a live concert and I was like, it's real, it's real, oh my god, I can't believe it, it's real. And then I had to, then it was just my mission that I had to get one, like I just had to. So then it was like another five years of like looking on the internet trying to find nothing, 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 until eventually, um, yeah, 2012, Ken Rich in California was making the modification again 
And uh, so I ring him up straight away or emailed him and just had to make it happen. Like it was, no matter what, I was gonna get one. And um, yeah, he sold me one of the ones that he'd put together initially. So I didn't have to do any work or, or anything. So he just sold me this the way it is. And this is, it's been the guy ever since, 10 years now. So what was your first paid gig and what do you remember about it? <laughs> my first paid gig? Oh my good, I don't know about my first paid gig, but I, I certainly know the first gig, I, I don't think I got paid for it. But um, <laughs> it was a really strange pub in, in uh, South Australia, in the city of Adelaide. And, um, and <laughs> my mum was going out with this crazy sort of like pot smoking blues player, guitar player. And he's, he's a big influence on, on Clayton and I. And um, he put this gig together. It was this afternoon gig in the pub, like a lunchtime thing for the, the tradies and whoever else were working around in the area. And oh, I thought it was all fine, like, you know, just to, I, but I did notice this kind of strange, like catwalk down the hallway of the, um, of the pub, which wasn't, you know, it didn't seem like a normal thing that it should be there. And then, um, anyway, we, <laughs> we started playing and then all of a sudden these like semi-naked women started coming down the, the hallway and, and, and stripping to all the, and all the guys like got their beers and they, yeah! and I th that's right, I think I initially, oh, cause I, you know, I was, a, I was a bit, you know, a bit nerdy and I'm just playing away and I think I had a solo or something and I'm like, oh yeah. And then I suddenly start hearing these cheering and I'm like, Oh yeah, I must be doing all right. Must be doing. All right. I look up, yeah, and there's these half-naked women coming down the hallway. I'm like, oh come on! But then I'm also like, ooh, what's going on here? <laughs> um, you graduated to some quality gigs. After That's that. right. <laughs> uh, you you played on Powderfinger's Vulture Street album. How did that come about? Yeah, so that came about through. Uh, I'd been doing a bunch of sessions at 301 with Anton. There's a, uh, Anton, he's an incredible engineer. And um, he was engineering that album. And then, yeah, he just rang me up. I don't think he even said it was Powderfinger when, he, when I got the call. Um, yeah, but I went into 301 and then sure enough, the fellas were there all recording Vulture Street. And I remember distinctly, uh, Cogsy had a video camera and he was like filming me from like the word go. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. They'd already done their part, so I was just overdubbing. And um, it was great tunes, and they were great, just a great bunch of guys, and had so much fun. And uh, yeah, it was really exciting when the album came out, and I could, it was probably that first kind of moment where I'd hear songs on the radio, and, and it was, they were smashing the album, and just hearing myself on the radio all the time, and I'm going, oh, that was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're a big part of Jimmy Barnes' band now. Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, well that came out from my brother. Uh, so Clayton moved to Sydney about four years before I did and he, uh, he started playing with Jimmy. I think Michael Hegarty, Jimmy's bass player, saw Clay play at a, at a gig somewhere. And so Clayton was, was playing in the band and then he went off to New York to try and, um, I guess, just to, to, to have, a, have a shot at, at being a cat in New York. And uh, they basically just said, do you want the gig? And I'm like, sure. So, oh, never been so nervous in my entire, my entire life, but yeah, it was an amazing, amazing gig to get. And I remember on the very first gig, like just before we were about to go on, he's like, listen, listen, I don't care if you fuck up, but just as long as you fuck up loud. <laughs> Uh, of course, you've got your, old, uh, your own band now, and you've released several albums, and you tour Australia and around the world. Uh, you've got a new album, uh, World Worth Fighting For. How long did the album take from start to finish? Uh, we went into the studio, I think it was August last year. So it did take a, quite a long time, actually, from, from when we first started tracking the songs. And there was a whole bunch of tours. We went to Canada twice, and then Europe, Europe twice as well. So there were a lot of big breaks. It was all very disjointed trying to get it all to, uh, together. And then I thought I had, it was that classic thing where you just think you've got so much time, you know, and you book, you book the release date, and you book the launch and everything. And then it's just like all of it, everyone's getting sick. You know, time's running out. So it was a real mad, mad dash to the end, but we, uh, we made it just in time. <laughs> yeah. So why is World Worth Fighting For the title track? Uh, I think it's, because I think it's my favourite track. 
Well, it certainly was my favourite track when we were we were tracking it and, and writing it. And it's a bit of a departure from a lot of the things that people know me for. You know, I had incorporated a few different sounds like the Mellotron, the beautiful strings, and it's a softer tune, it's not sort of, it's a bit more, you know, uh, what's the word, um, Just it just sort of cruises along, as opposed to most of the things I do where they're either insane or they're whisper quiet. Um, yeah, and I'm just really proud of the lyrics of that, and I think I'm just proud of that song, and I think it's got a good message. Um, you know, leaving, leaving. What kind of a place do you want to leave for your kids? You know, and, and for future generations. So, yeah, I, I thought it was just a good, it was a good sort of stamp for the album. Yeah. Uh, the latest single, uh, "Get Out Your Ears Way," features Bootsy Collins. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, Bootsy. Um, that happened a few years ago. Uh, I've always been quite prolific in in. Uh, sharing little clips and little videos of things, either full songs or snippets. And uh, one of the solos I did um, maybe four or five years ago, uh, yeah, he, he picked up on and he shared it on his page. And then I'm like, wow, I'm getting so many likes and so many more views here. And I realized it was because he shared it. And then uh, I thought that was amazing to start with and I thought that would be the end of it. But then he continued to share videos. and. Um, just before the world went crazy, he emailed me and asked me if I wanted to do some collaborations and wanted to do some writing for his next album. And of course, I was just, I was jumped up and down in, in, in hysterics. It was, yeah, amazing that such an idol of mine, you know, someone I would go and uh, source out all his records, like searching through Big Star Records in Adelaide, trying to find anything by P-Funk and George Clinton and Bootsy Collins. You know, to have someone like that want to actually collaborate with me was insane so ended up doing three songs him and his the title track to his latest album which is funk not fight and then when we went into track my album I, I went to Joel the bass player I said, oh, you know, oh, this is kind of a funky feel like it'd be cool to it'd be cool to get some like bootsy sort of vibes on it so he did he got the envelope filter and the wow and it's like mm, there's just one thing missing I wonder if Bootsy would sing on this track <laughs> or do his thing on it. And I thought, ah, it's worth a shot. I may as well, what have I got to lose? I'll ask him. So I did, I, I emailed him and then sure enough, 24 hours later, he'd already sent back like a rough vocal and uh, in 48 hours time, it was all, it was done. It was amazing. Bootsy, he's on my track. Um, the album is it's such a soulful album. Oh, Are there any classic benchmark albums that you were sort of using as a template? No, I don't think so. Uh, not really, no. I think um, it's just everything and all the, all the music that I've been exposed to. That's why on a lot of my albums I go through so many, so many genres. You know, I, I can't help myself. There's so many different things I like. But I think the one thing that sort of shaped the album, I think, is uh, is working with my friend and co-producer, Kieran Collings. He's set up an amazing studio with amazing desk, and he's uh, incredibly supportive. And and the sound of that studio and the sound of that desk is really, um, it's kind of inspiring. Like, it, it really changed things for me. I've always been mixing inside the box. And to mix out of the box on this beautiful SSL, and as soon as it went through that, I could hear, I could hear other recordings. You know, the music sounded like it reminded me of other things, and so I kind of just went with that. And uh, so it's probably a lot cleaner sounding album, a lot more hi-fi. Whereas all the other ones, I, I always try to dirt it up and make it a bit sort of nastier. But this one, I just went, no, it just sounds really beautiful. I'm going to keep it that way, and. Uh, and that sort of, yeah, um, shaped the sound of the album. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the keyboards you're currently using and how you acquired them. Sure. Well, this one here, the big, the big Hammond C3, this one came from Wombat. Um, another organ player called Rupert Hyde uh, had this for sale. I think I actually posted on Facebook because I was like, oh, I'm sick of playing this fake organ. Um, does anyone have a real organ? You know, a real vintage Hammond, like a C3, not a not a spinet one. And uh, yeah, sure enough, Rupert 
uh, messaged me and uh, he said, yeah, I've got this one. I'd love, I'd love it if you bought it. And uh, yeah, got in the van, drove down. That was, I'd say that was about 12 years ago as well. And it's been an absolute dream ever since. It really is an amazing, because they all sound different, an amazing sounding Hammond. And I'm yeah, thrilled to have this and it's barely anything goes wrong with it. I mean, obviously things do. It's from 1957, so it's, uh, it's over 60 years old now. Um, but it's still absolutely rocking, and I do not give it an easy ride of things, that's for sure. But I definitely give it a good go, and um, it always, I don't know, it likes it. It seems to respond well. <laughs> so that's the organ, and then on top, yeah, is the whammy clav. And this is the one I got from um, Ken Rich 10 years ago. This I have done a lot of things to, um, not, uh, not in the sense of changing sounds on it, but just reinforcing it because they're quite fragile. And um, I've, over the years, I've had to, the only way I can travel it overseas is in a soft case, so it gets beaten up by all the, the airlines as well. So I've actually done a lot of reinforcing and changing and coming up with little ideas to sort of make it a bit more solid. And, um, and in fact, just on the weekend, I redid the felt on top here, which was falling apart and covered in gaff and looked terrible. And every time I do a clip, someone would go, man, you gotta fix that cloud. It looks like it's about to die. <laughs> so I'll fix that. Now it looks nice. <laughs> it is actually probably in the best condition it's been in a long time. Is, it, is there a constant fear that uh, one day one of them will go down? Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I mean, things do happen to the clav on gigs, like I do break strings. Um, the tricky thing with breaking strings is uh, that when it breaks, it often will then lie over all the other strings. So instead of it just being, oh, well, that, I can't play that note, all the other notes go, dup, dup, dup. so you've got to sort of pull it, open it up, and yank it out as fast as you can, and it actually makes for some good theatre. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're here at the, uh, the Brunswick Ballroom tonight. Uh, yes. What's on for the rest of the year? Uh, so uh, we've got um, tomorrow, we're in Adelaide, and then on Tuesday, we fly off to Europe. We've got four weeks in Europe. Um, playing all amazing summer festivals. We're going to all sorts of places. Going Norway, Lithuania, um, the UK, France, Italy, Germany. Uh, yeah, and uh, so that's going to be great in the summertime. And then off to Canada, over to East Canada again, um, which we do quite often as well, which, uh, yeah, some more summer festivals over there. And then no doubt we'll go back to Europe again in December because, uh, yeah, they seem to like us there, so we keep coming back. <laughs> uh, Lucky Dolly, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Absolutely my pleasure.